Well, hello and welcome to Broadway Baptist today for our worship from Derby. My name's Rochelle and I'm the minister here and we are continuing today our worship from the Book of Acts, Going for Growth. And today it's from chapter eight in a time of persecution. Well, this worship is recorded at the end of a week where many are fleeing for their lives in Afghanistan. In Plymouth, a community is devastated with shootings. So our opening verses from Psalm 20 are a prayer for those in distress today. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Amen. We give you thanks for all the ways that you bless our lives, the beauty and abundance of nature, the love of family and friends, the joy of knowing you and hearing your word. 
send your spirit during this time of worship so that we may dream your dreams and see visions of the world as you created it to be. Guide our thoughts and actions. Bring us closer to you so that we may do your will and dwell with you forever. Amen. Jill is going to lead our intercessions today. Let's pray together. Loving Heavenly Father and Almighty God, in this hiatus of summer, we pray for those unable to take a break. Among them, we pray for carers, for essential workers, for those whose earnings barely cover, if at all, their cost of living from day to day for refugees living in very poor accommodation under restraining circumstances. Father, may there be fair and just provision in this country. May we at Broadway take up our share of care for those less fortunate than ourselves in whichever way Holy Spirit wants to lead us. We pray for the people of Greece and neighbouring Turkey who have suffered loss of family, homes, livelihoods in the horrendous fires this week. We pray for a rapid end to the fires, for comfort for the victims and their families, and strength and safety for the firefighters and those working to bring aid and relief. May relief monies find their way to the most significant areas of need. We hold before you the Greek government as they struggle to deal with the situation and with previous shortcomings. And we pray too for governments and people across the world to take seriously the very real dangers of climate change as this blue planet heats up. Father, hold your creation safely and give us all wisdom to know how to better treat your world before it is too late for future generations to enjoy the beauties of nature as we have in the past. Remembering those who have received school results this week, we rejoice with Matt Rowe over his excellent success and pray that he and other students known to this fellowship will be able to continue their studies in peace without further disruptions from coronavirus. For those whose results were not as were hoped, we pray that they will find new ways forward to fulfil their potential. May all these young people seize with both hands the opportunities open to them. May they come to know you as Saviour. Looking around the church building, we're reminded of the vaccination clinic soon to open. We ask that there will be safety and that the team and those visiting will know of your presence among them. We ask that they will be successful in their endeavours and thank you for the privileges provided to us through the NHS. We pray for a better and fairer distribution of vaccinations across the world and a waiving of profits by pharma companies to make doses affordable to developing countries. Father, open our eyes to see where we can work towards equality in world, worldwide health. As the leaders of the various church groups prepare for the next session, we pray particularly for brigades, a Broadway, Broadway organisation which sometimes tends to slip below the radar. We ask for wisdom and grace for Anne as she leads the team with their groups of young people in their activities. We thank you for the 11 families currently impacted by brigades and pray that the team will continue to gel with the children, that their care and concern will meet the needs of the children attending, especially those with their own emotional needs. Anne asks us to pray specifically for safety and enjoyment next term and an increase in numbers attending the youngest group from September. Father, may brigades find new ways to draw in children and bless the leaders as they seek new and vital ways to introduce Jesus to youngsters who have previously been told that stories of Jesus are fake news. Let's all take a moment to pray and intercede for specific situations which are on our minds. Heavenly Father and Almighty God, 
we gather up these prayers and believing that you are listening to us and will act, we ask them of you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. As we we forgive forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the the kingdom, the power power, and and the the glory are yours. Now and forever. Amen. to 25. Now, for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great and all the people, both high and low, 
gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptised and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. This week, the news of Afghanistan has been horrific. The years of terror that many thought were behind them is rapidly returning as the Taliban take over the country. People are fearing for their lives, for the return of harsh laws and punishments, stonings, amputations, and women are already experiencing rapid losses of freedoms that had been enjoyed along with education over the last 20 years. The UN appeals to neighbouring countries to keep their borders open as thousands are trying to flee the country. What do you think the priorities of those who are fleeing are? What do you think they are taking with them? What about you? If you had to flee your home today, what would your priorities be? What would you pack? What would you be concerned for? What would your concerns be as you travelled? We've all seen enough footage of refugees or spoken to them to know how awful it is to be on the road, to have to seek food, shelter, safety. In fact, watching refugees on the run, we know how all-consuming it is to find the essentials for life. But it is also when we are under most pressure that we discover what it is that is most essential to us. We're continuing our series in Acts, and last week our reading finished with the stoning of Stephen and a young rabbi Saul giving approval to his death. Acts 8 continues that on the day of Stephen's death, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. While godly men buried Stephen, Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Overnight, the church has gone from enjoying thousands joining them, enjoying the favour of the people, sharing lives, to being on the run. The church is scattered. People are having to leave their homes and everything they have known. 
While in scale, the young church is tiny in numbers compared to what we have been seeing this week, the horror for those involved was perhaps similar. But these refugees take with them their faith. In fact, it seems that their faith is increased because wherever they went, they preached the word. So firm was their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that they continued to speak of him as the Messiah at risk of their lives. Luke picks up the story of another of the first deacons to be appointed back in chapter 7, Philip this time. And like Stephen, he had a ministry of feeding the physically hungry by sorting food for the widows and feeding the spiritually hungry through his preaching and power. Luke records that as part of the persecution, Philip goes into Samaria. Now, we're not sure which city he ends up in, but as a result of Philip's powerful ministry, many heard about Jesus and they were healed and set free. And most importantly, there was great joy in that city. The outward manifestation of an inner work in people's lives was that the whole atmosphere changed. This is the result of people who have been forced to flee their homes, who don't know what the hot future holds, but they fully trust the one who does. They speak boldly, courageously, and lives are changed. No wonder there is joy. Well, that in a nutshell is Philip and others like him who scattered. But then Luke introduces us to Simon. Now, Simon's been in the city for a while, and at first glance, with his involvement in sorcery, I expect many of us would not identify with him particularly. We don't know how he got his abilities or what it enabled him to do specifically, but whatever it was, it must have been quite spectacular to gain a reputation and status for himself that people called him the great power of God. He enjoyed prestige and favour. That was until this refugee on the run from Jerusalem, a Greek-speaking Jew, usually held in contempt by Samaritans, usurped Simon in, in terms of attention. And yet, on the surface, all seems well. Just as Jesus had commanded that people believe and baptised, and commissioned his followers to do just that, so Philip obeys, preaching, demonstrating, and baptizing. And along with many in the city, Simon believes and is baptized. And then he starts following Philip around because he is astonished by the great signs and miracles. He has met his match. And overnight, Simon has gone from being the great power of God to meeting someone with even greater power than he has. We might assume that Simon has undergone some kind of change of heart from this and is wanting to learn. After all, baptism is a sign of commitment, a sign of new life, and he seems committed to wanting to learn. It's only after Peter and John arrive from Jerusalem and start laying on hands for people to receive the Holy Spirit that we discover that not much has changed for Simon. He went along with the crowd, believing and being baptised, but when he sees the Holy Spirit coming on people in power through Peter and John's prayers and laying on of hands, he wants to try to buy the gift for himself. You see, Simon has not understood the gospel at all. It seems like he has followed the crowd without understanding the implications. He has believed, he has been baptised, but his life hasn't changed. Simon's actions are a challenge to our foundations too. If I were to ask the question, what brought you to faith and why do you believe? I wonder how you would respond. We all come to faith for different reasons. 
It might be a relationship, a need, a realization about life, a trauma that you have been helped through or saved from. The gospel connects with us in different ways. It's a, a universal message, but it touches us uniquely at our point of need. And that's the grace. But we're not to stay at the point of need. The call is then for us to respond in such a way that our lives are turned around, no longer with ourselves at the centre, but for Christ. We are no longer to rely on our own lives, but the life that Jesus brings us. This is what repentance means. You see, although Luke records Simon as believing and being baptised, we now see that belief and baptism haven't caused the change of heart. The danger of the emphasis on discipleship today leaves us wide open to this issue, that a lot of effort is put into helping people come to faith, preparation for baptism, but that's only the beginning. The real challenge comes afterwards. How do we walk the commitment we have made? How do we learn to throw off the old ways of behaving and become more like Jesus? Simon's life up to this point has revolved around power, the pursuit of power and exercising it over others. And seeing Peter and John having the power of the Holy Spirit and passing it on to others he did what came naturally, offering them money to be able to do that himself so that he may maintain the status and position that he has enjoyed for so long. He had totally missed the point of Jesus' coming and what this messiahship looked like. Whereas Simon sought status in the words of Philippians 2, Jesus chose to give up his status, to come to earth. Where Simon sought power to be self-serving, Jesus came to serve others. And the Holy Spirit was given in order to heal and set people free. Where Simon sought for the Christian life to serve his own ends, Jesus called his followers to lay down their lives, pick up their cross and follow him. Simon had believed and was baptised, but without a heart change. He continued to think and behave in the ways he always had. It was the complete opposite of kingdom living. And this is what Peter picks up with him when he says, may your money perish with you. He tells Simon, your heart is not right before God, but there is hope if Simon will listen. Peter goes on to tell him, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. We are called to accept that things are not right to repent and turn life around and pray to draw closer to God. In other words, to take responsibility and come to God. That is the gift we have. If we accept our condition and come to him, he will forgive us and work within us. But still Simon doesn't pick up the responsibility for his response is, will you pray for me so that none of this will happen? And then Simon disappears from the pages of our Bibles, although church history has some interesting theories of what happened to him. As I have sat with this passage, I have been struck deeply by the contrast between Simon and Philip, and particularly the challenge for my own life. Every gospel in the Bible has Jesus warning his disciples to count the cost in following him. Luke records it in 1733, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it and whoever loses their life will preserve it. Simon had power and influence but he wanted to keep it at any cost. That was his focus and while he may have believed who Jesus was 
and him being the long-awaited Messiah, it didn't change his heart. And he didn't see the need or want to take responsibility for his life. Even after Peter had spoken to him, Simon's request was for Peter to pray for him rather than him own what he had been warned about, to repent and pray. In contrast, while we don't know how Philip came to faith, we see that when under pressure, he was willing to lay down his life, prepared to lose everything for the sake of Jesus. His faith was an essential in life that strengthened him as he fled from Jerusalem. It compelled him. It flowed from him wherever he went. It came at a cost. But he brought transformation and joy to others. When we take communion, we are reminded of the great cost that was paid for us as Jesus laid down his life and overcame death in order that we might experience transformation and joy. The invitation to share in communion is the invitation to remember what Jesus has done, to receive the grace that he offers and to remind us to hold on to the hope that God is at work amongst us. So as I close, let me ask those questions that I posed earlier again. What brought you to faith and why do you believe? What difference does it make for you and for others? Let's take a moment to be quiet.
Well, as always, as we come to a close today, if there is anything that has touched you today that you would like prayer for, please do get in touch. As we go, may the God who comes to us in the things of this world bless your eyes and be in your seeing. May Christ, who looks upon you with deepest love, bless your eyes and widen your gaze. May the Spirit, who perceives what is and what may yet be, bless your eyes and sharpen your vision. May the sacred three bless your eyes and cause you to see. Amen. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets.